This video covers extract 4 from the A2 F585 paper, Trends in World Trade and the Pattern of Trade. In the introduction, we can see that the volume of world trade is discussed, but also the long-term change in the pattern of world trade. The pattern of world trade is who you trade with and what you trade. At this stage, the uh, extract brings us more towards the issues of globalisation. Remember that the whole pattern of the extracts is from uh, national UK economy things through to globalisation and everything in between. Please note the key uh, relevance of questioning the theory of comparative advantage mentioned here. So what do we need to focus on? The fact that uh, there is weak growth in trade recently. Um, that the pattern of uh, trade accounted uh, between developed and developing economies is something we will examine. The regionalization of trade, which is referred to also in Extract 3, is uh, highly relevant. And the uh, examination of the theory of comparative advantage. The volume of world trade. Growth and trade slowing since 2011 because of the financial crisis uh, and its effects on aggregate demand in all the developed countries. This is particularly acute in the Eurozone um, where um, the level of GDP continues to be poor. You can see that in the data provided for you in the extract. In the graph shown here you can see just what a, a sharp break in the increase in world trade um, the financial crisis and uh, the recession of recent years has had. It is now picking up, but still growth is not as fast uh, as it has been uh, in the average from uh, the last 10 years. So, uh, since the stimulus has been written, um, we can see that uh, the trade is going to rise to about 3% uh, uh, in 2014. Uh, rise by 3% and uh, to about 4% in 2015. But that's still below the average of 1993 to 2013 of 5%. Uh, there are risks to that pick up in growth up to 4% this coming year um, from tension, conflict and that sort of thing. Um, at last, the EU has uh, began to pick up, but it's still very slow growth there, and so that affects trade. Because, of course, if the EU has low growth, uh, they don't have much money to spend on imports from other countries. Here we see um, the comparison of growth uh, in the developed and the developing world. It's quite clear here that um, the fastest growth has been in uh, the most developing parts of the world and the slowest growth the most developed parts of the world. Um, the exception, if there is one, is the United States, which by 2012 had picked up to a reasonable level of growth, um, uh, even as the EU still maintains a uh, uh, sort of stagnant uh, economy. So what is it about um, the developing world or what that gives it higher growth? Well, at the moment, it's a bit shaky because of falling commodity prices. Uh, many countries in the developing world rely on primary products, and oil prices have fallen recently, which will affect their, their value of their growth. But overall, you'd expect developing countries to have a higher growth potential. They have surplus labour, which can be used uh, uh, and, and twinned with capital to make uh, very high levels of growth. There's a lot of uh, opportunity for them to pick up on newer technologies and therefore for their GDP to go from low to high quite quickly. That's growth. Um, China um, continues to grow very fast, if you think of the last slide, but, um, not, uh, but it's been growing fast for a long time like that because it has plentiful labour and uh, has been investing very heavily in capital, so it can produce a lot. Um, its growth, though, is not that good at picking up imports from everyone else, um, so it doesn't always help the global economy quite as much as its weight m you might imagine, because um, it is not a very open economy to imports. Um, in the developed world, uh, growth has been very weak, uh, with the exception of the USA. 
um, and that means they haven't picked up a lot of the trade, hence low trade growth recently. Um, regionalization of trade means that uh, it's very difficult for um, EU producers, for example, um, to find different uh, markets. They're sort of already locked in to the regional economic group, perhaps through um, uh, common external tariffs and uh, free trade within the features of a customs union. So, why has trade slowed? Why has the volume of trade slowed in the period examined in the extract? Uh, although we do know, as I said, that it's beginning to pick up again. Well, uh, the shorter run uh, main points are the crisis, um, low aggregate demand, um, austerity policies in European countries and uh, Britain um, have reduced aggregate demand, hence demand for imports. So we're all spending less, so we all buy less from each other, hence lower trade growth. The Eurozone crisis in particular has been um, a real problem. Uh, Japan's been stuck into a rut of deflation for a lot of the twin last 20 years. They spend less, there's less aggregate demand, lower prices and so on. With deflation on the horizon in Europe now, it, th this rut of low aggregate demand might continue. And indeed, some economists see this as a longer-run phenomenon, the idea that um, there's no longer uh, that much opportunity for innovation around, um, there's no surplus labour in um, developed countries. Indeed, uh, the percentage of the population which is labour force uh, is going to fall as the population ages over time, um, creating a, a, an idea called secular stagnation, which is that... Um, the n that uh, long-term growth is no longer um, likely. We now move on to the pattern of world trade. So often when we talk about trade, we talk about the volume of trade, how much we're trading, how much we're exporting, how it's grown, how open we are, how much the balance of trade. Um, but here um, now we're moving on to talking about the pattern of trade. Not how much we're trading, but who we trade with and what we are trading. This is going to have a big impact on the kind of question they're going to ask in the exam because it opens up the whole area of um, um, regionalization um, versus globalization in terms of the countries that we are trading with and other countries are trading with. Um, and it also um, makes very relevant question of comparative advantage and is this the explanation of trade. Examining the boring bar chart 4.2 you can see that over the 20 years there's actually been no change in the percentage shares of trade that's just between the rich countries of the world or trade between rich and poor countries of the world or trade amongst poor countries in the world. The only thing you can really draw from that figure is uh, the very low amounts of trade within developing countries, that's an area that they need to grow. Um, I, at the bottom of this page, you can see I've said there's an over-reliance uh, on using developed countries as buyers of products. Um, for the countries of the global south to grow a little bit more uh, vigorously and stably, they need to develop um, plenty of markets uh, and, and trade amongst themselves as well. It's something that certainly serves uh, the EU and other developed areas very well. Um, what is interesting, though, is the figures in the last 10 years, if you start from the middle figure and work to more recently, you can see that the trade uh, between developed countries has risen proportionately more than uh, the trade uh, between developed and developing. Um, remember that trade has increased massively over this period overall, so there's not that there hasn't been globalization. It's just that regionalization us buying more products from our near neighbours has been even more of a thing than uh, us buying more products from China and what have you, to give an example. So there's the conclusion. Greater regionalisation of trade, but even uh, although there's been a growth of trade north-south on the globe, there's even greater growth of trade within the developed world. Uh, what does that mean? Well, one thing is that comparative advantage might not be the main explanation for uh, trade, because surely, uh, if comparative advantage was the main reason, we would trade mostly with countries that made the most different products to us, um, which are likely to be countries with different factor endowments. Um, it makes no sense, uh, clearly, 
uh, and obviously um, uh, at first glance to uh, be trading more with countries like uh, European countries which we have similar um, relative factor endowments. One reason for this and evidence for it is the growth in intra-industry trade which is covered later in the extract. There's more trade at the uh, than before um, and there's much more trade than before um, uh, in between uh, areas uh, of the same industry um, by which I mean um, the same sort of products being traded for different countries. Again, uh, a challenge to the comparative advantage model. The other thing uh, that we must bear in mind as a reason for greater regionalization trade is the trade diverting effects of customs unions. Joining regional economic groupings like the EU and like um, uh, ASEAN for Asian countries has meant that they encourages trade amongst the region but discourages it uh, away from the region. But the most useful um, bit of data here is the figure 4.3 figures on intra and extra regional trade because that brings it all together for us uh, all the uh, main topics of uh, extract 3 and extract 4 and we can see two big things in the volume of uh, world trade has risen hugely uh, in the last um, 10 years in particular but the proportion which is intra-regional has grown even more have a look at the data below um, the four points below that I've written uh, and, and consider those um, main takeaways from the data One thing you may have noticed uh, is that the Europe figure says excluding EU intra-European trade. Now that's quite interesting because what we have here is data that counts the EU almost as one country. So when it's looking at intra-regional trade on this um, little diagram, intra-regional uh, is all the trade between EU and all the other countries in Europe, the countries of EFTA, uh, and the EEA, like Switzerland, Norway, and so on, which are not in the EU. Now, that's quite a lot of trade, um, and it's a large proportion of the trade in 2011. But, um, of course, there's an enormous amount of trade that goes on within the EU, and we know, uh, which is not counted here, and we know that there are very good reasons for that, because it's a customs union, or common market more properly, um, the equivalent figure, um, if it was measured in the, uh, if you measured all the countries of Europe separately and uh, examined it uh, compared to the Asia figure or the America figure in this, is uh, 6.6 uh, 6 billion uh, trillion dollars, uh, as written down here, 6,612 billion dollars. So, what does that show us? Well, it shows us that. Uh, Intra-EU trade is huge, and that's not shown on this graph. Um, don't forget, Europe is bigger uh, than it appears here. Um, uh, but also, um, it shows you uh, that um, even without the EU effect, um, being in the continent of Europe um, promotes uh, a lot of trade. That figure there of 71% showing that there's a lot of trade within Europe even if you're not within the European Union. This demonstrates that proximity, known as the gravity model, uh, as opposed to perhaps comparative advantage, is a very, very good reason for trading. It makes sense. Low transport costs, uh, common uh, cultural norms, um, uh, similarity of uh, demand patterns and so on but it's not the law of comparative advantage in particular uh, that's driving this one of the things uh, that's been disappointing over the last uh, 30 or 40 years is the low standard of living in Africa of all the developing uh, parts of the world it's developed least uh, but was poorest uh, in the first place so that over 30 40 years while incredibly poor countries of Asia have transformed their standard of living you haven't seen the same in Africa the good news is that that's beginning to change um, so you can talk about uh, not just the 2012 figure uh, in your um, extract of 9.3 percent growth um, 
but you can talk about the fact that it's now uh, uh, over the last f uh, uh, 10 years been growing faster than Asian countries although it's still a long way to go. Um, one of the reasons why um, Africa hasn't grown so much is it's not been so exposed to world trade. Um, if you think of the Asian tiger economies, they built their miracle growth on trade, international trade. Think of Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, China. So um, there is a connection here between the low amounts of trade in Africa and the fact that they still haven't got very high GDP, though pleasingly it's growing. Um, other key uh, requirements for development uh, might need to be thought about if you want to discuss why Africa has been a problem and, uh, and, and how it might be improving. Moving on then to uh, not just who we trade with but what we trade, um, you have this very surprising bit of data which is this index of intra-industry trade for various economies between 1996 and 2011. It's not a well-known um, measure uh, at school level uh, of economics. Um, so by crowbarring this in, it's a clue that there's got to be some sort of mention of it somewhere in the exam. Um, what intra industry trade is trade within the same sector, that means uh, producing the same sort of product, as opposed to trading one thing for another. This is the big bit of uh, evidence that comparative advantage is not hugely important. Um, uh, as the, or at least the, not the only explanation of um, trade uh, in the world, because there is a very high figure, 70 or uh, 60 to 70 uh, percent, or 60 to 70 index points for the developed countries in the world of intra-industry trade. Now that could be horizontal or vertical. So it could be, if you think of trade, let's say between Japan and Britain. Uh, it could be horizontal in the sense that we import cars from Japan, but Japan imports cars from us. That would be intra-industry trade as opposed to um, Japan selling us cars and we are selling Japan packaged tea, which might fit more with the law of comparative advantage. The other way in which uh, intra-industry trade is going to happen vertically in the production process. So uh, sort of components of cars uh, might be uh, built in Japan and sent to Britain, and other components of cars might be built in Britain and sent to Japan. Um, with the greater globalization of firms, multinationals and globalization and outsourcing of process, you might see more of that. All right, um, intra-industry trade is very big. It's a third of Japan's total exports, to give an example. Um, either then, as I said, this makes comparative advantage less important, or it's just possible that what it means is the law of comparative advantage is working at such a subtle level that um, you might have a comparative advantage in one sort of car and another country in another sort of car. Um, one country like, um, for example, uh, the iPhone is often cited as a very globalized product. Um, you couldn't say that China has uh, a comparative advantage in electronics or America. Some parts of the of the iPhone are made in America, it's designed in America, it's, it's assembled in China, other key parts are made in Germany, other key parts in Japan, other in South Korea. All seem to have firms that specialize in that very, very minute subset of electronics that does various parts of the iPhone. Um, it may also explain uh, uh, why intra-regional trade is growing because, of course, if you have more and more trade within similar industries, that'll likely mean more and more trade within s between similar countries, and those similar countries are often within the same region. So if you have more growth in, in, in cross-European firms, for example, um, I always think of a, a little one of these supermarkets that's big across Europe, and the more uh, time goes on, you see more Europe-wide uh, businesses. As they trade with each other, that'll be often, uh, and within their groups, that'll be intra-industry trade and also intra-regional too. Um, for more on the intra-industry trade issue and how this is measured, that index, it would be quite good, I think, if you could drop the name of the uh, Gruber-Lloyd uh, index, I think it's called, um, then 
the Grubel Lloyd index, then uh, have a look at this video that I made on it. Um, if you can't get it from uh, this by uh, clicking here because you're watching this on YouTube, um, there's the link to it just there. The final bit of data which relates to the pattern of world trade is data uh, on uh, comparative advantage. Put simply, we have a list here of uh, major secondary industry and uh, a list of countries that have gained comparative advantage and lost comparative advantage. Um, bear in mind, uh, remember the definition of comparative advantage is being able to produce something uh, at a lower opportunity cost. Um, it's what you're relatively uh, efficient at. And the developed countries of the world generally have uh, lost relative efficiency in these products and the developing countries have gained relative efficiency in these products. This suggests that they that the developed countries of the world will do better by specialising in other things, perhaps tertiary industry. Um, it reminds us that there are plenty of reasons other than comparative advantage uh, for being competitive um, because we will uh, look at this question over and over again with all the data we're looking at. Is comparative advantage the only uh, explanation of uh, trade success? Um, reasons other than comparative advantage to revise them are are you a member of a trading bloc, a regional economic group like the EU which takes away your trade barriers, much more likely to trade uh, there than not, that's the regionalisation point yet again. Um, there's all sorts of reasons to buy products from abroad uh, which aren't just to do with their cheapness, it's because you like their brand, their name, um, uh, the country of origin adds to the um, uh, prestige uh, and all other aspects of non-price competition. One major reason why you might be competitive, even if you don't have a comparative advantage in something, is if the exchange rates move in your favour and become weaker. Um, that's obviously going to make you more competitive, and arguably that's the route that China has made to break into a lot of export markets by continually managing down the, um, or rather preventing the excessive rise in the value of its currency, the renminbi, the yuan, um, uh, by manipulating the exchange rate. Relative inflation rates affect competitiveness. The lower inflation you have, relatively speaking, the 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 uh, weaker your real exchange rate and the cheaper your products are. And there are all those other things covered a little bit in uh, Extract 2, actually, in the World Economic Forum's Competitiveness Index of, of the sort of qualities a country might have in terms of infrastructure support, lack of regulation, uh, and stifling bureaucracy, good institutions and good conditions, which make a country not only better to locate your business in, but um, uh, um, more competitive uh, because you can produce better quality products or produce them more cheaply because of the quality of your production processes. Um, bear in mind this comparative advantage data isn't theoretically uh, deduced and calculated, it's, it comes from something called real comparative advantage. And what they're just looking at is the percentage uh, of uh, trade that the countries listed here contribute uh, compared to the percentage of trade that that product is uh, in the world as a whole. So if their figure is o greater than one, when you measure that, then that ratio, then you can see that a yeah, country is more than proportionally producing that kind of product, and therefore it's deduced from that um, that they have a comparative advantage. It's a slightly dodgy thing, therefore, to say this is definitely comparative advantage because it might be some other reason why, uh, like, for example, some sort of um, uh, state subsidy that makes um, this country export more than its proportion. But that's the, that's the data anyway, uh, reveal comparative advantage. Um, the exception, I suppose, is France in manufacturing. Slightly surprising, but by and large what you've got is uh, predictably um, the developing countries are uh, gaining comparative advantage in manufacturing and of office and telecom equipment and machinery uh, and the developed countries are losing comparative advantage. That's not really that surprising because if you think about it that's pretty much what we mean by development uh, or at least certainly what we mean by industrialization. So we have this question running through the whole piece. Is comparative advantage a good predictor of patterns of world trade? Um, 
we have plenty of evidence either from regionalization, the large amount of intra-industry trade and the figures from comparative advantage that you could bring into an essay as evidence that it is not a brilliant predictor of the patterns of world trade. What might be a better predictor? We'll have a look at um, extract three again and think about regionalization and all the, the widening and deepening of regional economic groupings uh, promoting that and all the other reasons I've given you why you could be competitive without having a comparative advantage in particular. Set against that, you could easily say, ultimately, um, uh, it's perfectly feasible to suggest um, that there are co subtle differences in comparative advantage between Germany in cars and Britain in manufacturing airplane engines. They may seem very similar, but uh, the, these are very specific and, and, and technical uh, types of production, and um, the differences in comparative advantage could be subtle. Um, there's certainly some evaluation there. Um, the high intra-industry and intra-regional trade shows globalization is more complex than just production moving to the source of comparative advantage. Um, that will be the most s summative summary I can come up with. And that's the end. Thank you for listening to the video.